Thanks, Roger. And um, I'm not a rap artist, and I've just broken my glasses. So I'm oh. hoping, like hell, that they'll hold on for the purpose of the presentation. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming, and it's great to be here. Biosecurity is a vital part of our economy, as we know, and it's not just about protecting New Zealand's primary industries. It's about our tourism sector, it's about our way of life. It's about our land, it's about our seas, it's about how we want to enjoy the country that we live in and share it with the tourists that come to our lands. But in terms of the primary industry sector, which is where I'll put some focus today, out of our sort of $50 billion worth of exports, we have some really fast growing sectors. If you look at pit fruit, it's doubled to 750 million over the last four years. So what we're seeing in terms of our trade environment is a much more complex system than when John and others started out in the biosecurity world many years ago. So what we're trying to do with this direction statement is to build on what's going really well, to learn the lessons, but also to understand the changes in trade flow and what they mean for the dynamics of how our businesses and our country need to respond. So if we look here, our view of the world is that trade is a very dynamic two-way street. Over the last 15 years, and we modelled this because, and I'll use that for the purpose of my presentation, because it really shows what life was like on an incremental time for a long period, and then really how things have changed substantially in the last five years. But you can see that 30% of our imports came from developing countries, and now half of them do. And we know that they have stronger and higher biosecurity risks. If you look at our imports, they've grown by 78% over the last 15 years and our export receipts have grown by 67%. So what that's telling you is not just that our wealth comes from trading in the world, but actually that we're completely dependent on global trade for our standard of our living and the way that we fund our social security and other systems. And so what we do here today is really important for the base living standards of everyday New Zealanders and the lives that we have. So our dependence on this global trade, it's really important that we think about it in this big and broader picture. What does it mean for our companies? So they have to operate within a really dynamic and ever-changing environment. Much more complex markets, much more complex global supply chains, where we're in market, not in market, et cetera, et cetera. And we're making what you do really well in your country, like growing animals and growing horticulture, is no longer a recipe for success. It's about understanding customers and markets to secure premium products against our competitors. And today I want to think a little bit about what does our biosecurity story mean for how we can help support export growth, but at the same time look after our border? So indeed, our biosecurity system does and will continue to provide value and opportunities, and our statement is about how we can make it better. How can we leverage and use the New Zealand story to achieve that? But what does this kind of growth mean? Up on the slide you can see really major volume growth. They're big numbers, but what does that mean in a week? It means that we process the entire city of Dunedin for biosecurity purposes every week. It means that 17,000 shipping containers, which would roll around the world four times over, are inspected every week. And in our mail system, 600,000 items come through, all of which were x-rayed. So this is the responsibility that MPI has through our biosecurity system to manage on behalf of New Zealand. But yeah, it's not all about volume growth. The channels and the products that we use <laughs> are evolving and we've seen a phenomenal increase in mail. If you look at the shift in mail, up until 2010, we saw just really incremental increases in everything and now we're seeing a complete shift in where we need to put our resources and the type of biosecurity we need to perform at the border. And our cruise industry has had substantial growth. It's now worth $540 million for this financial year. And the 3.4 million travellers that came to New Zealand and now Tourism New Zealand has 11% growth year on year. So we're going to see another million and a doubling indeed over the next seven years. So substantial increase, which we need to support the country with. So what's driving this growth? We know it's tourism, we know it's our docket state, and indeed Lou will tell you all about that shortly. But in terms of our primary industries, there's a substantial drive from e-commerce. And what we're seeing there is a response to other market competition and other consumers and markets where we're seeing increase in air freight. We've got $2 billion worth of um, air freight going now with primary industry products. That's 0.3% of volume, but it's our high value, high perishable, high price goods. So what we're seeing is the association of our country and our country's brand and market providing export opportunities. 
If you look at what does e-commerce mean in real life, single stay in China recently sold $18 billion or all of Brazil's entire prime ministry economy in one day. And they were 27% of international brands got sold. So we had a little look at what would that mean for New Zealand primary sector exporters. And the numbers are quite interesting. 70% of channel online and team wall on single sale was a relationship between our primary industry products, our New Zealand country brand, and consumer associated responses to do with New Zealand products. So if you carried a New Zealand brand and you had a strong brand, you were selling extremely high in market on that day. And what's behind that brand? And part of what's behind that brand is the success of our biosecurity system. The fact that we can make disease-free pests and claims, whether it, and also to support other claims like grass-fed, et cetera. But I think this is a new and emerging component of our primary industry sector. And jumping to my last slide now, that is really my challenge with primary industries is how can we leverage the benefits and success of our biosecurity and border management system to convert into higher prices for offshore export receipts, which we can then return back to our economy. So how do we actually run our system? We're quite simple at MPI, or at least I am. So we have three things. We want to keep the risk offshore, we want to manage the border, and if something gets through, then we want to deal with it really well, as best, as quickly, and as efficiently as we can. Our biosecurity system enables us to demonstrate freedom from disease. This is material to our primary industries and tourism. So how do we do this? Internationally, we want to push the risk offshore. We have staff offshore in many countries. And in terms of the biosecurity side, we have auditors offshore that make sure that other countries meet our import health standard requirements. So if you think about importing Japanese cars, we have, um, we have staff in Japan that audit the systems of the exporters and do, th and do sampling on cars to make sure that they can come into our country pest free and, of course, New Zealanders enjoy lower-priced uh, cars and fairly uh, new models. Same with PKE manufacturers. We have import health standards. We register and audit premises, and we expect those standards to be met. And when they're not met, you see that we act firmly about that. And it's utterly important that we act firmly and are seen to act firmly, because that indeed incentivises everybody else that's dealing with our 1,000-plus import health standards. At our border, you've already heard today, our ports and airports are where we check with people, goods and crafts, and there's been quite a lot of additional investment in our system. The border levy was really important for us, not just for asking senior ministers for more money, but actually we need to be able to flex our border in both ways. We need to flex it in terms of volume, but we also need the freedom to flex our border in terms of the shifts and the channels that our exporters and tourism are using. And this just gives us incredible freedom. And through that method, we've actually also increased our frontline staff by about 25% in the last five years to respond to volume, and we'll see what happens over coming years. But we also run an internal surveillance system. We have about 60,000 surveillance traps around the country in areas where we know are high risk for certain pest pathways, and we have an 0800 pest line. And we get about 10 to 15,000 calls a year, leads to about 2,000 investigations, and we set up about 20 to 30 responses as a result of the public and industries input into us. And this was the germ of the idea of how can we turn what we do as a regulator into a biosecurity system of 4.7 million people. We ha already have well-attuned industry, we've got great partnerships, but actually we've got a whole lot of New Zealanders that see a pest and ringing because they're worried about it. So how can we use their goodwill to the benefit to all of us? And that was what's behind that strategic direction. But of course, nothing is waterproof, and it's like running an insurance company where P equals one, and you can only reinsure it to the extent that you can afford to. So indeed, things get in the system. And on the 17th of February, 2015, we found a Queensland fruit fly in Greyland in one of our pest traps. So that tells us that the system's working. We caught it before it was able to fully establish. And as you can see up there, we cost us $17 million to protect horticultural trade of about $2 billion. But we didn't do it at a national level. We didn't need to do it at a national level because we know how our biosecurity system is layered and we know what needs to happen. So once we found it, we imposed restriction zones of um, 80 kilometres and, and closer in, which meant that we didn't really risk $2 billion worth 
in the end we only had to really fully protect $25 million worth of export, exports for that particular incursion. And you know, behind the scenes we went very quickly as well to our trading um, countries. We identified the 14 where Queensland fruit fry presence in New Zealand would be really significant. And we went to them with targeted communication so they would understand what the issue is, how we were managing it. And again, our reputation for a trusted border system meant that their reaction with us was as appropriate and measured as we would hope it to be if the boot was on the other foot. And we had situational awareness in our trade system. So at the same time as knowing where those products were going, we also sat there and thought, OK, so what if this really does get out? Now, we don't, as a, and established as a pest, we don't want to lose trade. We don't want to zero trade. So what we need to do is identify those markets where we can still sell this produce, and all we're going to lose is the marginal price. And so great fortune is we never had to go that far. But again, our system is set up to answer those kinds of questions. And of course, we worked very closely with local communities and the affected industry. And at the same time, I really want to thank Lynn O'Connell, our colleague from Australia. We worked very closely with the Australian federal and state governments through this process. And um, I think our relationship's a lot stronger as a result. But what about the big ones on the animal side? We need to be ever vigilant about what can happen on this side of the ledger as well. So we're great to be foot and mouth disease free in New Zealand, but we can't afford to rest on that. So we have a huge human capability program which looks at learning the lessons from other countries. So if you look on here, you'll see the trade impact. So when um, there was beef exports dropped out in the UK 2000 to um, 2005, they could only process, send processed um, products to the EU, nowhere else. All other markets shut down. And then we see that it slowly caught up over time with the EU. But then if you look at other trading partners, it was a lot slower. I do wonder now what that will look like after Brexit, um, because the EU relationship for trade is obviously very different to one that we have. But when you look at all the FMD prevalent countries and then you look at the ones who sell into markets like us, we can see that we get a 28% premium on price by being FMD free. So it's a really significant and what we do is spend a huge amount of time on capability, doing preparedness exercises both internally but also with partner countries and we're always on a learning system for that. So where do we go from here? As you've already heard today, our biosecurity statement is about building on what's going well, learning the lessons of what we can improve, and thinking about it from the perspective of our economy, our environment, our health, and our way of life. So what does success look like? I think we need to be able to detect and eradicate pests faster and easier than we have before. So our statement is deliberately biased towards strengthening science, technology, building human capability, and getting all New Zealanders involved in this challenge. And I honestly think that if we do this well together, we'll see some significant success. But I just have a challenge as well, being me, <laughs> for our business colleagues here today, which is we put two, you know, tens of hundreds of millions of dollars into our biosecurity system. And we are maintained, we've had the majority of our major pests and incursions have stayed out of New Zealand and diseases, which enables us to claim pest-free um, claims on international export certificates, etc. But I think we're sort of at early days of using the benefits of our biosecurity system with a New Zealand story or that, that um, New Zealand trade and enterprise have run or indeed industry stories to draw those things together and come and work with us about actually where can we support your market access and your trade wishes and hopes for your business to go further by allowing you to be able to claim, use the regulator to claim higher premium um, brands around our biosecurity system. I really think we're at the early days of that, and I think we can get a lot higher prices in market if we start to move that way. And tomorrow in the workshops, we will be happy with Julie to raise that in discussion. Thank you.